just want to thank everyone for being here this evening, especially Roy. Um, we were originally supposed to do this as a live program. So I appreciate everybody being here and being in our new normal and doing Zoom with us. Um, you, uh, we'd also like you to look for our future programming online. And um, you can always call us and see if we're doing any programs. Um, like Carla said, um, please mute your mics because we are hearing a little bit of noise. Roy's going to talk about 40 to 45 minutes and then he will answer questions. You can type them into the chat. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Roy. So go for it, Roy. Right. Thank you, Donna. Thank you for arranging this. And uh, Carla for uh, assisting with the tech tonight. And I'm very pleased to be here to do this. Of course, it's been a long time since I've been out on the terrain with anybody. And I don't like that at all. So we have the new reality, and that means virtual tours. So let's make the best of it. And uh, I've assembled quite a few slides for those of you who know my slide presentations. They are certainly image driven. And uh, I have quite a few images to get through to talk about Euclid's six geological claims to fame. And they are. I'm going to try to tr use some uh, color coding here. The orange I'm going to reserve for the places we're actually talking about, and uh, the blue is going to be the kind of commentary, the uh, uh, commentary about what's going on. So we have basically six things to talk about, and if you grant that Euclid Creek includes Euclid Falls and Mount Baldy, uh, there's another two. Um, and they cover a lot of time. I'm going to organize this by time as much as possible. It tells a story through time, and we have to develop a framework to talk about everything that happens in Euclid that we can see today that began in this old life era, the Paleozoic Age of Fishes, 540 million years ago. MA is mega annum million years. And uh, we don't see anything in Euclid that's 540 million years old, but this Chagrinia anotis, a fossil fish, uh, is about 420 million years old. So it's in that paleo, excuse me, yes, Paleozoic period there, as is the Euclid bluestone at about 370 million years. All right. And uh, then we take a big jump to the age of reptiles, the middle life era, Mesozoic. And that begins about 250 million years ago. And that's a time that we don't have much in Euclid. No place in Ohio has much from the Mesozoic, the age of dinosaurs, because at that time we were lifting out of the sea and no more deposition, all erosion. So everything that might have been here during that time is just washed away. We have landforms, but no fossils, no rocks, nothing like that. And then we jump, jump, jump to very recent period, the absolute end of the last glacial period, um, uh, just 23,000 years ago, the last advance uh, up until the present climate time, which is about 11,000 years ago, uh, kilo annum uh, Ka. Okay, I'll be using these, these uh, kinds of uh, abbreviations. All right, now, so why do we do this? One is that Euclid has, in the whole region, maybe even the state of Ohio, more named geological features or natural features than I think any other municipality around, certainly in Northern Ohio. Cleveland may have as many uh, named, you know, recognized by the Department of the Interior features, but Cleveland is six times as big as Euclid in its area. So Euclid really does have an amazing assemblage and that is because it goes from the lake at 570 uh, feet above sea level up to uh, relatively the top of the portage escarpment that's a little over a thousand feet. So about uh, 400 feet in there, actually closer to 500. But anyway, that is more vertical relief in Euclid than you find in most places in Ohio, even in Appalachia. You know, the average municipality is not going to have a vertical difference, vertical change of four to 500 feet. Now, in Euclid, it's spread out over four miles, so we don't often appreciate that change in elevation. But because of that, we have a lot of rock exposures, the chance for fossils, interesting landforms and the like. So that's why we're doing it. But beyond that, to me, this is another aspect of Euclid 
for which we can be proud. We have a city that uh, evolves very quickly on the social and economic scale and uh, very slowly on the natural scale. But since our nature covers more than 400 million years, Large. there's been a lot of evolution and we have things for which we can be proud to undergird the socioeconomics of our area. Great. So if you ask me, Roy Larrick, where do you live in the world? I would say I live on the Portage Scarp. That is, if you strip away all the political uh, boundaries, uh, where do we live? The Portage Escarpment. That is our feature. And I'll talk about this in a minute. But it's the Portage Escarpment that cradles Lake Erie. It's the Portage Escarpment that supports the Lake Plain, the Heights, and uh, everything down to south to the uh, divide, the Ohio River Lake Erie Divide. Okay, so Portage Escarpment is it. Let's take some time to talk about this. <clears throat> Uh, you can see Lake Erie there, and you see just to the right or the south of Lake Erie is a square rectangle. That represent, that's going to be a constant through my geographic slides, and that uh, represents the um, Euclid Public Library. And I had a hard time pinning that down on this slide. But if we start from there, we go, the green line is the spine of the Appalachian Mountains, and then yeah. The white line then is the edge of the Appalachian Plateau, which is the Portage Escarpment, the edge. And that goes right through Euclid, right through Cleveland. And then it takes a dive southward, as we'll see. So the Portage Escarpment, once again, is the cradle for the Great Lakes, certainly for Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. And it's the edge of the mountain, so to speak. So Central Lowland and the Appalachian Plateau are separated by the Portage Escarpment. And let's tease this out a little bit and uh, try to get a better sense of what an escarpment is. So if we start with a hill, we know what a hill is. If you look at it in profile, it's a, it has two sides and it has a high point, right? Two sides. The inverse is going to be a ravine that has two sides and a low point. An escarpment is an edge. It has, it separates a highland from a lowland, not a point, but a land, highland, lowland. And that means that our escarpment, the Portage Escarpment, separates the Appalachian Plateau and the Central Lowland. It's as simple as that. Uh, now, why does it get that way? That's a complicated story. Why is there this difference? Why do we have this edge? It, we'll find out tonight. But if we look at Euclid Avenue, if we trace the elevation of Euclid Avenue through Euclid, throughout Pennsylvania and Northern Ohio by this white line. This is what the base of the Portage Escarpment looks like. Once again, right through Euclid, not too far south of the public library and takes a dive in to the Cuyahoga Valley. Uh, and then it, it dives southward toward Columbus uh, through Mansfield. All right, now we're, we're doing some background here before we really get into this. And there are <clears throat> four processes or actions or natural forces that give us what we have and just want to mention them. Erosion, uh, for tonight we're going to talk about erosion as rainfall denuding highs. Okay, rain hits the ground, it becomes runoff and when it hits the ground it starts to splatter and pick up sediment and our area being mostly as we know clay turns to mud, it washes away very easy. That means that our streams, when it rains, are muddy. And our feet get muddy when we're just outside because of this erosion, rainfall, picking up sediment, being charged with sediment that comes from high, relatively high areas. Could be just a little pile of dirt on your yard, or it could be the top of the Portage Escarpment. Picks up some sediment, some mud, and starts taking it downhill. And deposition then is when that charged runoff, that muddy runoff, gets to the bottom and can't go any farther, in a low spot, it starts to fill in the low. Erosion, deposition, the two most common geological or natural processes in our region, and erosion is the really the prominent one. And then the one that happens mm, just a couple of times here is tectonism, and for us that's going to be land rising, falling as well, but uh, for us, it's basically land rising, and when land rises, it gets higher, the rainfall hits it, what happens? Erosion. It starts to get low again, which is what has been happening for a couple hundred million years here in Euclid. 
And then finally, glaciation. And as a glacier advances, the ice pushes forward and it gets charged with mud and rocks and everything else. So it erodes in the sense that it picks things up and incorporates it inside, becomes dirty. You know, the concept of the comet is dirty ice. A glacier is very dirty ice. And then when it melts, all the stuff that's in that glacier just drops out and you get deposition. And we have some of that in Euclid, both the erosion and the deposition from advancing and retreating glaciers. All right, so let's look at how these actions play out in Euclid in five ways. And uh, the one we're going to start with is foreland deposition. What the heck does that mean? I'm going to talk about what a foreland, foreland basin is in a minute, but our foreland deposition gives us basically our bedrock column, which is what we stand on, whether it's down here on the lake plain or up on the heights, uh, we're standing on a bedrock column. And then about 200 million years ago, the dating is very chancy here, uh, we get our tectonic uplift and we get the Appalachian Plateau rising up, okay, straight up. And then at the same time, we start to get the rain falling on this and we get tens and tens of millions of years of rainfall, which gives us our portage escarpment, uh, draining northward to a river that predates the Great Lakes by tens, hundreds of millions of years, okay. And then we come recently and we have the retreat of the last glacier and it stopped for a while in Euclid. All the junk dropped out of it. We get the Euclid moraine and then finally uh, we get the uh, rainfall eroding what the glaciers left behind and we get Euclid Creek out of that. All right. So those are the major actions and their products in Euclid and our six claims to fame come from all this. Now the chancy one here is Mm, this Mesozoic period, the tectonic uplift and the rain law, since there are no rocks that represent this, we really don't know when about 200 million years ago this was. But it may have been as much as 200, it may have been as few as 60 million years ago. Okay, we just don't know. So let's start with Foreland deposition. So there's one more term, a Foreland basin that relates to tectonism. And I'm going to use an example first of the Zagros Mountains and the Persian Gulf as an example of a tectonism and a foreland basin. So you see to the left, the Zagros, uh, um, Iraq basically, and the Persian Gulf, nice there, and Saudi Arabia to the south, okay? So the way this works is that um, the Zagros Mountains form by compression. It's not an uplift, so to speak, from the from the mantle of the earth, it's compression of the, of the crust southwestward, and you see the folds of the Zagros Mountains there. And when we do this, to go to the right, when we compress, you get the push up the folds of the mountains, and there's a kind of counteracting subsidence, which is the Persian Gulf. So, you know, for every action, there's a reaction. Compression gives you uplift, and there's got to be some subsidence. The Great Basin is an example of this. The Persian Gulf, because it's below sea level, has seawater in it. It's uh, very impressive here. But that's the kind of situation that we had 400, 350 million years ago that gives us our bedrock column. And that's because, basically, when you get an uplift, you get high, rainfall comes, and it starts to denude and deposit in the lowland. So all of our bedrock column comes in this depositional area at the base of the foreland, at the bottom of the foreland basin, okay? All right, so let's go to our area. I had another hard time placing the rectangle over the Euclid Public Library back 360 million years ago, but here we are, Pangaea, and let's take a closer look. A, um, um, th this is not totally accurate, you know, but the equator and how the land mass we call the United States fit there, uh, right on the equator 360, 400 million years ago. We have the Appalachian Mountains with the alluvial plain out front and the Foreland Basin where the stars are, and I'm going to show that. That's the next slide represented by the rec rectangle here. And then I'm going to go to the green rectangle, which is uh, going to be an example of how we, how we can find depositional processes today in the Mississippi mouth that resemble what we had here 364 million years ago. Okay, so to the red rectangle, 
And our Foreland Basin in this map is called Ohio Bay, better called the Ohio Basin. And uh, the Appalachians are to the right. You see a few rivers coming in. And Cincinnati is a little ridge on the other side of the basin where, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia would be for the Persian Gulf. And then I want you to notice, if I can bring my cursor here, Berea Delta, this river coming down, distributing itself into the bay. Berea is there for, city of Berea wasn't there, but the rocks of the delta are quite prominent in our area. So now let's go to the Gulf of Mexico and see how our sediments built up at the bottom of Ohio Basin. So we have this area and let's go into the mouth of the Mississippi and what's coming out of the Mississippi always, especially in floods, is sand, which eventually gives you sandstone on the, on the bottom of the sea, silt, which for us gives us bluestone. It's a fine sandstone or siltstone, eucal bluestone, and clay gives us the massive shale deposits we have here. So if you go by color, the sand is the kind of buff color. This, the silt is going to be this light blue, and then the uh, clay is out here in the Gulf, the darker. All right. So our Paleozoic seed bedrock common, what accumulated in the Ohio Basin 400, 350 million years ago, is the column on the right. You may have heard some of these names. And these are the rocks we have in Euclid up to the top of uh, the Berea sandstone. We have nothing in Euclid. We don't have the orange peel shit. All right. We do have the Euclid bluestone, which is like the Berea sandstone, but finer, that's in the middle of the Bedford Shale. Very strange thing, uh, but it is unique to Euclid, South Euclid, surrounding areas. Okay. And it's a claim to fame for us. And then our fossil, Chagrinia and Notice, uh, comes from the Chagrin Shale uh, at about, well, probably 400, 420 million years ago. All right, so uh, 200, we're, we're going to say 200 million years ago, we have tectonic uplift, straight up, no compression, just straight up from the mantle of the earth. And that gives us our portage escarpment bedrock column, which is varies, which varies from what I just showed you in the sense that it's exposed and eroding. So here we have it. And you see there's the funny marks on the Berea sandstone that represents waterfall. Where When our area was lifted up, the Berea sandstone is very resistant. So it tends to stick out of ravines and make for waterfalls, cap rock that makes for waterfalls. And here then our, our, our uh, claims to fame uh, as they're distributed vertically in the Portage Escarpment bedrock column. Okay, so Moss Point right on the lake, Chagrinia notice. So the lake is 570 feet, 200 feet above, you get the, the fossil. Mount Baldy, the top of it is 780, and you can read up through there. Okay, so we have about a thousand feet of bedrock column in which we have our claims to fame. Uh, let's cap this off then, this uh, introductory part, with a, um, just a review of the advance and retreat of the last glacier, which begins about 24,000 years ago in our area. We have the ice coming upstream in the Erie Basin. By 23,000, we know it's in Cleveland, south of Cleveland, and uh, up the Grand Valley. And by 22,000, it's moving along, 21, everything probably, but you know, Chesterland and the high parts of Geauga County is covered with ice. And by 20,000, we're finished, toast, there's no land. And then the ice builds up from there. The coldest time is about 20,000, 19,000 years ago. But then the climate changes and we start uh, to get glacial uh, recession pretty quickly. So let's go to that. How does this glacier recede? I'm gonna to go to a different scale, look at the area between the Cuyahoga and the Chagrin Valleys, Lake Erie in the north, uh, what I call the Bluestone Heights. The uh, white rectangle-y thing there is University Heights, just because it's centrally located. You see our streams out uh, going to the north. Uh, PS is Public Square, UC, University Circle, and 3C is Tri-C, just so we can get some bearings in this. All right, so 17,000 years ago, the ice is melting quickly back from uh, Columbus area, and uh, we're still covered. Okay, uh, but by 16, 15,000 years ago, we can recognize the evidence for a time when the glacier stopped. And what that means is glaciers 
even when they're melting, they're always pushing from their point of origin. So you get a southward push always, but when you get a melt, you get a northward melt. And if it's really warm, the glacier melts. But there are times when push equals melt at the front and the glacier stays in one place. The front stays in one place and all the dirt that's in it drops out. Now, if, I, if you can see my cursor, there are tiny ridges here, there, here, here. This is all part of this defiance moraine here, here. But the, my line, my green line goes right over the top of the highest part. We know that's the case 16, 15,000 years ago. The ice stood there. And what that means is that melt water came off the ice and started to form our major creeks going to the south at that time. All right. Now they go to the Chagrin River here on the right Pepper Creek, Willie Creek, or to the Cuyahoga River, Mill, Bear, and Hawthorne. All right. Now the glacier starts moving northward, starts melting northward again, and it stops again in this area, which is called the Euclid Moraine. And we're going to talk about the Euclid Moraine in this area up here. Uh, but when it stops this time, melt water, everything, we get our lake streams basically forming the upper courses of them and they're draining right into the glacier and who knows what's happening with all the water, but uh, they're draining right into ice at that time. And the Euclid Moraine is forcing Euclid Creek, the East Branch, what we know is the East Branch to go westward from nearly the Chagrin River uh, to the main branch. Okay? So the Euclid Moraine. Then eh, a thousand years later, so we have another moraine that's called the Painesville and two more, stream, more, more streams form, the lower runs of Kingsbury, Morgan, and Burke, and then Gully Brook, if you know that one, a chagrin tributary. All right, and then by 12,000 years ago, the ice is melting quickly, it's gone from our area. And as it goes, things start to change in a hurry. It, uh, the, our area revegetates very quickly, the forests come quickly, and the big mammals, I choose the two biggest ones, Mastodon Mammoth, come uh, by about 11,000, 12, maybe, well, let's, let's say 11,000 years. And certainly by 10,000, there are Paleo-Indians living here, and they are hunting the mammoths and mastodons. We have good evidence for that in northern Ohio. Okay. And uh, all right, so there we are. That's at about 11,000. And then if we go forward, I show these pictures of the landscape, uh, Euclid Creek, all of them. Uh, the top one is the maybe the interesting one that looks from Euclid Avenue southward into the park, into the Euclid Creek Reservation. I show this because there aren't many trees. This is taken in the 1930s. It had been totally denuded about 1900, and the trees are start, starting to grow back. But you see how small the trees are on the right here, um, in this area here, and over here. You know, this is up near Monticello Bridge, and there are no big trees at that point, all deforested. Okay, now... <clears throat> I, this is what I've just been through is so important that I want to go through it in another way. And we're going to look at it in a frontal view in a schematic form. Okay, so the next view I show is going to be looking in, in the direction of the arrow, but from above. And that's what you have, right? Chagrin River, Cuyahoga River, the time in between, and our major streams, University Heights, tri -C, and then what I'm going to do now is put on two red lines. We're going to use those as to mark a slice of the pie. We're going to take away and we're going to end up with a surface uh, with, a, with a, what's in the sandwich uh, between points A and B. And that looks like this. I hope this is comprehensible. Point A is just above the Chagrin River. Point B just above the Cuyahoga. We have all of our bedrock units, Euclid, is the red rectangle, Tri-C, UC, and Public Square. Got it? And top is at 1,200 feet above sea level, Tri-C. Well, that's the place where this defiance moraine is, where the ice stood uh, about 16, 15,000 years ago. And uh, that's, uh, we're going to start here, and we're going to trace the ice downward. So our first one comes to about 14,000, and that's the Euclid Moraine, basically, uh, around the Bluestone, and the Lake Maumee, just about at the top of Richmond Hill, um, Chardon Hill, uh, Cedar Hill. Uh, those were beaches for the highest lake here. And this is then the up, the headwaters of our streams form at this time. And then 
as the glacier retreats, the streams get longer. And at 12,000 years, Niagara Falls opens up. And because the ice was heavy upon that area, it was depressed and Lake Erie it was much lower than today, like at least 40 feet, maybe 70 feet lower. And you know, the lake is not very deep. So it wasn't very deep at that point. We have these streams. And then as the lake has risen, oh, I forgot one thing here. Then uh, when this Niagara Falls opens, these streams, th we say that their gradient increases. And that means they start to cut through the rock. And our ravines, our deep ravines for Euclid Creek over here, and for Doan Brook, uh, Cedar Hill, and the Dugway area of Lakeview Cemetery and Forest Hill Park there. It's there, and I want to show then here a, um, an oblique view looking across, uh, so above Shaker Heights, looking across Doan Brook, Doan Gorge, and on you see here to Blue Rock Brook or Cedar Hill right here. And then I get something on my screen, so I can't point. But uh, Dugway West and Dugway East over here, right? You see what we have going on, a rapid carving of our major valleys. And Euclid Creek is the same thing. Okay, then the lake comes up to its present level and we get the drowning of the valleys. The lake comes into the valleys. And I have this wonderful picture from the 1890s, Euclid Creek. Uh, St. Joseph Academy, Villa, St. Joseph Academy, the nuns with the boys, presumably on a Saturday, and they're, you know, in this drowned valley that is the harbor of Euclid Creek, or used to be the harbor of Euclid Creek. Okay, finally, we get to our six features on the landscape then, and that will be, we're going to go from south to north, Euclid Falls at Anderson and Green, and then Euclid Bluestone, basically at Welsh Woods, and the Euclid Moraine, uh, Chardon Road, and uh, then down to Mount Baldy at a um, little south of Chardon Road, and finally to Moss Point uh, at the lake. Okay, so let's go to the one place tonight that's not within the confines of the city of Euclid, but in South Euclid, and uh, you'll recognize Monticello, Green Road, the intersection there, and Euclid Creek on the right, and Nine Mile Creek. These are sister streams. And Nine Mile Creek, unfortunately, has been filled in uh, within the dotted lines. So this area that I'm calling the Gulch of Euclid Falls was twinned with the Gulch for Nine Mile Creek. You can still see part of this at uh, Denison Park in Cleveland Heights. But let's go to Euclid Creek. So uh, you have very interesting formations. First, I want to say that all the quarries, the inverted yellow triangles, are the Berea sandstone quarries that are represented here by this dark orange or brown massive here with low cliff faces all along in South Euclid. And the bluestone terrace is here. And the quarries for the bluestone are in a different position. They're lower down than the Berea sandstone quarries. And a few of them over on Nine Mile Creek as well. All right, so let's take a look at some natural features here at Euclid Falls. And part of the falls itself, the falls extends for about a quarter of a mile. The sandstone is quite thick and it's in layers. so it come tumbles down a series of steps. But this is the falls just below Anderson Road. You can stop at the sidewalk on Anderson Road, uh, just east of Green, and look down and see uh, these sandstone layers and the creek tumbling over. And then uh, I love the area of the gulch in the metro parks because you have these uh, rock shelters, Berea sandstone rock shelters. And these are places where you know Native Americans camped for a little bit while they were hunting in our area. Uh, quite impressive. Um, uh, landscape uh, for our area, considering we have both Lake Erie and then uh, 950 feet above it, we have these sandstone rock shelters. This is wonderful stuff. Let's move downstream to the bluestone area. And once again, that is the bluestone surface is this lighter orange. All of these green lines are sidings for the Euclid Railroad. And all these sidings represent areas where sandstone was quarried, the Berea sandstone here, or the bluestone down in these areas, quarried, milled, put on rail cars, and taken north. Then. So you see that these, these sightings changed. They weren't all in use. You see the farthest one goes almost, well, pretty close to Anderson, above Bluestone Road. Um, really quite extensive. So let's take a look at landscape from this Bluestone Terrace. Right, so this is Welchwood. You see that when the 
uh, when in 1918, when the park uh, came to be, that there was much less vegetation here. The bluestone is right at the top, uh, Cleveland Shale, and then Chagrin Shale here. And you see this uh, man is standing in a thick level of bluestone, which is this. Some of you may know Cathedral Rock, which is right in this area here. It's just north of Monticello Road. And it's not a natural feature. The rock is natural, but it's, it's a part of the uh, um, rock that was left in place. So a railroad, so one of the railroad trussles, trussles uh, could be put over the creek here. So, you know, it's quite an impressive formation, but the uh, precipice is not quite natural. So, and then we have a photo of uh, working, actually uh, quarrying out the bluestone in this area over here. Okay? So Euclid bluestone, our claim to fame, you know, bluestone exists really only on the east side of the Cuyahoga and only really near Euclid and Nine Mile Creeks, um, down to Mill Creek uh, in, uh, in Cleveland. Okay? But the stone is very restricted. All right, now let's go to Mount Baldy. <clears throat> which is just a wonderful feature. Most people know it, you know, as you go south in Highland Road, as you're wanting to turn right into the Metro Parks, off to the left is this bare cliff face. That's Mount Baldy. It's not nearly as impressive as it used to be because it's, it's gotten a lot of forest cover on it. But I want you to see that it is, uh, we have this old meander scar. It comes out and here's another meander scar. And this is called an outlier. And it's the product of the east branch of Euclid Creek eroding in here, meeting the main branch here with a lot of power and then eroding in here. And the, it just left this little neck and point out here, which we call Mount Baldy. And let's look at it in another. I'm going to, the next shot I show is, is uh, uh, from uh, looking to the southeast, uh, just to the neck. And this is what we see. So Mount Baldy itself, and then the neck, and it connects up to uh, the area, I can't remember the name of the road up here, but a residential area up here. This is the level of the bluestone down to here. Okay, bluestone has been removed from this area. I'm not quite sure why. This is Cleveland Shale right in here, and then the Chagrin Shale. So let's take some other views of it. Uh, uh, recent views, the Chagrin Shale up to here, the Cleveland Shale up here, you see a big difference. And then you really see it over here where the Chagrin Shale is gray and smooth and the Cleveland Shale is, this is in the sunset, a beautiful sunset when this picture was taken. It looks kind of pinkish, but buff colored and, uh, and black, a combination here, okay? And then the Euclid Moraine, which we'll talk about is out here. And yes, um, so we're facing north from Mount Baldy, looking out toward the lake and the last feature before the escarpment ends is the Euclid Mori. All right, now the fish, the fossil fish, Chagrinia enotis. And it was, first of all, it was found in 1960 in an area, the description is 500 feet downstream from Mount Baldy on the east side of the stream. So the yellow area marks it as well as we know. And uh, this is it. It is a coelacanth, which is a Devonian fish, so a fish we know back to more than 400 million years ago. It's like sharks. It's a living fossil. Uh, these are still found in the Indian Ocean. Uh, this is a very small one. The ones, there are huge ones and there are the ones today are like three, four feet long, uh, but this is just five inches long. You see scales here. And if I go to the next one, uh, nice publication came out in 1962. This is unique. Chagrinia, after the chagrin formation from which it came, and in notice means smooth smooth scales, okay? So it's the only one known of it. It's the only member of its genus. It's absolutely unique to our area, to Euclid, okay? And this is a close-up of the bases. Lost my cursor. <clears throat> anyway, uh, the, the strange patterns there are uh, uh, the bases of the scales, the anchors for the scales. Okay? And there's a modern example uh, these are caught once in a while by fishermen in the Indian Ocean, north of Australia, south of uh, Indonesia, a uh, deep part of the Indian Ocean. And they, they, so they lived in the Ohio Basin in the bottom right. Okay, now let's hone in 
a little closer to home. And let's pretend we're standing at Babbitt Road in Euclid. We're looking westward to uh, East 22nd, uh, but everything is taken away. We've just taken a big hatchet and chopped all the earth, taken it away, and this is kind of what we'd see. So the east branch of Euclid Creek is flowing westward here. I have oops, lost my cursor, so I'll have to wing it. And Mount Baldy is that surface of the east branch of Euclid Creek between the bluestone and the creek itself. So the green, uh, the green line represents the exposure of Mount Baldy through the Cleveland and Chagrin Shales. Okay? And then down to the right, we have our last topic for tonight in a few minutes, Moss Point. Okay? And then the steps up, uh, Lake Plain, up to a terrace that we call the Industrial Corridor now between the tracks. Euclid Avenue, and then, then right now we're going to talk about the Euclid Mooring, which sits on top of the Euclid Bluestone for most of its course through Euclid, and uh, kind of tumbles off down toward Euclid Avenue. Euclid Mooring is, once again, this ribbon, we're, we're viewing it in cross sections, so it's long, long, long. It stretches from New York State to Euclid Creek, and uh, if you cut through it, you would have a kind of triangular cross section, vertical scale exaggerated. Chardon Road runs on top of it, and um, it is a, um, <clears throat> it's a mass of clay. So if we look at it in plan view, I think you can see the shading is by elevation. So Chardon Road runs across a kind of orange ribbon uh, from Euclid Avenue all the way to the Chagrin River. And uh, it's very difficult to get photos. This is a subtle feature. It's 30 feet high at the most and many times it's just 10 feet high. But once again, on the lower left, you see, the, you see the, that photo is in the green rectangle and the green rectangle represents the point of view from Mount Baldy. Lost my cursor, sorry. Uh, Mount Baldy at the bottom of the rectangle northward to the moraine which is the little bump in the photograph below. And on the lower right-hand side, you see on the right of the photo, there's an open bank, an eroding bank. That's the muddy mooring that uh, was cut through in Chardon Road. We're looking down Chardon Road toward the lake, essentially, toward Cleveland and the lake. Hope this all makes sense without the cursor. Now, uh, so one more thing on this map is HO on the right-hand side, and that is the Hatch Otis Nature Preserve in Willoughby Hills, just off Chardon Road, uh, Chardon Road and River Road. Okay, and I want to show a few photos because this is where you can really see the Euclid Moraine and its uniqueness. Do I have my cursor? No, nope, I don't. Okay, so this is a wild area where the Chagrin River cuts through the um, uh, Euclid Moraine, and it uh, it's this is just a small nature preserve, uh, but it's a very nice one, and. Uh, so the wildness of it is on the right. And let's look on the left too. In the upper left, you see that mm, here's the top of the bank. And then it's a eroding, wet looking bank. And there's not much vegetation. You look at the bottom photograph on the left and there's the same thing. Gives you a better color that there it's dry. But you see when the river erodes through this moraine, uh, it starts to slump. It starts to work its way downhill. And what that means is that very little can grow on it. Trees can't grow on it. They just can't get a footing. So we get shrubs and, and uh, kinds of vegetation that can survive dry areas. In the springtime, these eroded surfaces are saturated with water, but they dry out in the summertime. So we have almost a desertic environment at Hatch Otis and other places on the Euclid Mooring. And that, you know, in prehistoric times within the city of Euclid, gave environmental diversity to our area itself. Okay, lastly, Moss Point. And many people don't even know what Moss Point is. It's just a little bulge in the shoreline here uh, between Euclid Creek, between Euclid Creek, which is at the lower left, and uh, the county line, basically, between uh, to, uh, 250th Street is about its extent. So. The, uh, the settlement that developed at uh, the Triangle 
the convergence of Babbitt Road and Bliss Road or 222nd uh, was historically called Moss Point. But this bulge in the shoreline has had that name since 1797 when a man named John Moss settled the area that's now Sims Park and uh, cultivated, uh, cut the forest down, or maybe not, there were some Indians that had been living there. Anyway, he took this cleared area, uh, grew some crops, and from then on, 1797, it's become Moss Point, sometimes called Euclid Point in the old literature. <clears throat> okay, and the, I, the thing is that when you're on the head of Moss Point, you can see to the Cuyahoga River downtown and to the Chagrin River. So it's a navigational marker and it is more prominent as a navigational marker than its subtle bulge might suggest. Okay. All right, so why should this little thing be here? Why should we care? If you overlay a geological map of the area on this area here, you get this. And <clears throat> interestingly enough, there is a kind of a finger of shale, chagrin shale, that sticks out into the lake Either side of it is glacial fill. And uh, so the shale is just a little more resistant than the glacial fill. And that means that we have this bulge because it just doesn't erode quite as fast as the glacial fill. Okay. And you see that this map uh, was made in 1903 and the settlement was called, this was still township days, Moss Point. Okay, now why should this be? Same map but larger scale. And uh, we see the chagrin shale is this kind of brownish purple and the Euclid blue stone and the Bria sandstone are the kind of uh, gray, gray light blue colors. But there are these fingers of glacial fill there. And these represent within Cuyahoga County, the two uh, pre-glacial valleys that are now buried. The left one or the west one is Rocky River and that's totally buried and the Cuyahoga was re-excavated by the Cuyahoga. The Rocky River takes a different course through there. Just after the last glacier retreated, it just said, I'm gonna find a new ravine. And you know what the Rocky River looks like. It's a deep, steep-sided ravine uh, through uh, Fairview Park and Rocky River, all in the last 14,000 years, okay? The Cuyahoga uh, was a, the smarter river maybe and uh, re-excavated its old valley. But the fill, the valley itself, took a turn to the Northeast as far as Moss Point and Euclid. Okay? So this is the edge of the Cuyahoga Valley. That is the west side of Moss Point is the east edge of the Cuyahoga Valley. Now, unfortunately, this map was not made for Lake County. So we don't know what that little bit of glacial fill is on the west east side of Moss Point, but it's probably the west side of the Chagrin Valley, which is also a pre-glacial valley. So here we are on the divide between the old Cuyahoga River system and the old Chagrin River system. The divide is not there today, but that's where it was at one point. So, uh, you know, before the glaciers came, so before two million years ago, Moss Point was a kind of low promontory looking over a deeper valley to the north and overlooking valleys to the west, the Cuyahoga, and the Chagrin to the east. Subtle, but very interesting area. Okay. That's what I have to say about our six geological claims to fame. So let's review and, uh, and just see what we can make out of this. So we have these features that cover more than 400 million years of Earth history. And we can see them, you know, we can't see the fossil that's in the museum, but we can go see the Euclid bluestone, the Bria sandstone. Um, and then we had the time after that when all of this, all that rock column, that rock column rose out of the water and uh, became the Portage Escarpment. The river systems developed, the old Cuyahoga, the old Chagrin, the old Great Lakes River, and uh, we get Moss Point out of that. And then we jump ahead and we start getting these glacial features, the moraine, okay, and then after glacier retreats, Euclid Creek with Euclid Falls and Mount Baldy. So here we are, and uh, why should this matter? Well, all of these, if we go, if we go to the Ice Age, Euclid Creek, the Moraine, um, well, let's take all of it, the Portage Escarpment, um, 
all of these features are, in modern terms, watershed features. Okay? So these are places where we can identify the modern watersheds and they are basically the modern streams are destroying these and that's okay that's the, that's the way things work um, but what this brings up is the issues we have with rainfall runoff today remember the first thing i said was erosion and that is a major problem today erosion because we have paved so much of our area that when it rains and it seems to be raining ever harder longer these days we get tremendous flood flows and erosion that takes sediment out into the lake. The lake gets brown very quickly and um, also pollution, all kinds of pollution out there. So, you know, this is to, to, to understand our watershed issues. Really, you have to understand the evolution of the hydrological systems that get us to the present watersheds and understand where, how these streams have been changed, how they are eroding and picking up sediments and all the rest of that. That's of course another presentation entirely. But to end this, I wanna go a different way. And that is to the trees. And let's call it forest ecology. And since we're in a city, we'll call it the urban canopy. Now, this is the one photograph I have that's not in Euclid. This is the Great Meadow at Forest Hill, Forest Hill Park. And it shows a number of oak trees and some sugar maples in here. And, uh, you know, at one point, our area was covered by trees like this. And with an understory that you don't see here because uh, John D. Rockefeller isolated the trees. Uh, but, you know, we have these trees. Uh, at one time, city of Euclid had six Moses Cleveland trees. We're down to one now, and I'll show you a photograph of it. Uh, but the trees, to me, represent, you know, life on the rocks, life on the geology, life on the, you know, the uh, inert processes that I've been talking about. And uh, the trees represent the past, these big old things like this, and they also represent our future, because as climate changes, some of these big old oaks of this type, the sugar maples, are not the trees of the future. They won't stand in a warmer climate. So we have to take care of our trees, legacy trees, and be thinking about what to plant. And the city of Euclid has, because of its environmental variation, some interesting patterns in trees. Okay? And if I can uh, take, if we go to the top, here we have our cut of uh, cut through of the geological profile. So on the top, we get a specific kind of oak that's a chestnut oak, and it's called ridgetop oak. And even the name, the species name is Quercus oak, uh, Montana, the mountain oak. And this is an Appalachian tree that grows on the ridge tops of the mountains in uh, uh, Appalachia, in high Appalachia. And wouldn't you know it, it sticks to the ridge tops here. Now, our ridge tops are not high. Our ridge tops are basically the tops of the ravines, okay? But these chestnut oaks like to dig their roots into the Berea sandstone at the edge of ravines, into the Euclid bluestone at the edge of ravines. So these are our heights trees, our, our portage escarpment trees. And on the right-hand side is a bur oak, and this is our one surviving Moses Cleveland tree. This is on East 241st Street, just south of Lakeshore Boulevard um, and uh, near East 238th, south of the boulevard. It's a beautiful bur oak and bur oaks tend to grow in the plain. They don't grow on high broken ground. So you rarely see bur oaks up on the Heights area on the escarpment of Euclid. But, and they aren't all that common on the Lake Plain because they're big old trees and some, at some point people want to take them down. But anyway, this is a fantastic example of a burr oak tree that's certainly 200 years old. And uh, it's, I think, a good, uh, these are good symbols for the range of variation in one species, or one genus, I should say, of uh, the oak genus, chestnut oaks on our escarpment and burr oaks on the plain. And, uh, the Euclid Shade Tree Commission, I've just become a member of it, and we're working on a project to identify the distinctive trees of Euclid. And I want to I suggest that you can help us do this by
by sending me information about uh, trees in your neighborhood that are distinctive in some way. They're either very handsome, very old, very huge, um, uh, just different than any of the others. And I'd like to put together a list then that from which we can study the current distribution of distinctive trees. Okay, So we're calling this Euclid distinctive trees. And <clears throat> once again, back to these two oaks, the chestnut oak leaf on the left, the burr oak leaf on the right, these to me are good symbols of environmental diversity in Euclid. And I just put them, point them together. Uh, out of diversity, you can achieve unity, uh, which I hope the Shade Tree Commission can help us do because the trees grow on the rocks. So there we go, Euclid Shade Tree Commission. And with that, questions. You may have to unmute yourself to ask a question. I got. A, I have a comment. I when uh, when I was in my teens, preteens, we used to go up into the area where the uh, Euclid Euclid office and uh, medical building is now, yes. and uh, we used to call it the sand pits up there. And we uh, we found um, small fish fossils and arrowheads up in that area. <clears throat> is, is that, I mean, is that common in Euclid? Well, yes and no. Uh, the, um, the fish fossils, no, fish fossils are not common. The only one I know of is the one I showed you. There are certainly others. Uh, but Euclid, the exposed cliffs of Euclid are not hotspots for fossil collecting. Now, arrowheads, that's something else. We have Indian Hills, and uh, there, before it was Indian Hills, that was a place where you could find arrowheads and pottery. Okay? And on the other side, you know, Indian Hills is on the west side of uh, Euclid Creek. And on the uh, east side of Euclid Creek, so at the top of Chardon Hill, that was another hotspot. And those areas are mirror images of each other okay? on promontories overlooking Euclid Creek east and west and overlooking the lake to the north. So those were hotspots. And I now, the area that you talk about, so that's what we call Hillendale these days. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. All right. That is, I didn't mention that tonight because there's, it's a very interesting area, but there's nothing named there. So that didn't enter in. But the Hillendale area is the headwaters of Burke Brook. And uh, uh, the, you know, the Euclid Spur goes right up Burke Brook, which was a beautiful ravine before 1964, 65, when uh, I-90 Euclid Spur was put in there. Uh, so yes, sand deposits, beach, beach areas uh, along Euclid Avenue and farther south and farther north. So you would expect sand there, and there was commercial sand pouring there. You know, there used to be the old interurban railroad that went along Euclid Avenue, and they got their sand locally along Euclid Avenue out of sand pits there. Okay? So you're right on that. Um, and I imagine that there would there, there could be some very old spear points, not arrowheads, but spear points, the kind that were used to hunt mammoths and mastodon that could be 10,000 years old on that beach ridge that is presently Euclid Avenue. Okay. So, you know, I don't know what you found. But interestingly enough, uh, when you find arrowheads in Euclid, they're often, you know, three to 7,000 years old. That was a time when people were here and their arrowheads accumulated over time. Okay. So, but we recognize them. Now, the other, I want to mention one more hotspot for arrowheads, and that is the basically Lloyd Road and Lakeshore Boulevard. And there used to be a natural salt seep there. And the salt seep then drew mammals, uh, deer, uh, white-tailed deer, elk at one point, and bison also. Okay? So you get the animals coming to, to lick the plants that are rich in salt or lick the salt off of rocks or the ground. And who's going to be following them? The Indians. So you get arrowheads in that area. Those, right. are, those are the ones that I know about within the city of Euclid. 
Yeah, the uh, the place where we actually found uh, the fossils was, a, are you familiar with the Hillendale Bridge? Right, yep. Um, that it was where that was built, where uh, they might have excavated for some of the footings. That's mm -hmm. where we where we found uh, a couple of fossils. Okay, well, that's right. There is that is uh, the, uh, the the base. There is shale, uh, so it's that chagrin shale that that uh, chagrinia notice comes from. So it stands to reason that there are fossil fish there. Thank you. Yeah. Roy? Yes. Hello. Happy, <laughs> happy quarantine news. <laughs> yes. Um, I had a comment and a question. First of all, I really needed to take my mind off of the things I normally think about. There is something strangely soothing about thinking about the ground you're standing on 20,000 years in the yes. past. <laughs> um, also, last night I was at Manor Hens with my son and I was trying to show him there is something so distinct about Lake Erie rocks. And we have a fireplace downstairs that people always see was made in Lake Erie rocks. There's something about um, the pastel, the various pastels that always stood out to me when you look. I, I've never seen a beach like it where you have like a pink and a like a like light blue and a light green. Do you know? Do you know what quality I'm talking about when when you think about the rocks that wash up on the beach? First of all, and second of all, if you do, right. is there some sort of explanation for that? Well, anything that's going to be in the pink area, pink to 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 reddish brown, rust colored, and even more red, it's going to be iron. All of our rocks uh, have iron, and some more than others. It's the chagrin shale. Uh, there are siltstones within it, a little like the bluestone. They're covered with iron. So many, for example, the skipping stones sometimes can be reddish brown, and they can they can go to pink. But I think, as I think this through, uh, what you're seeing that's pink is probably granite that's not local to the area. These are rocks, the pink rocks, the granites, the quartzites. I didn't talk about those because that rock as bedrock is found in the far north of Canada, around Hudson Bay. And that's where the glacier that covered this area originated over what's now Hudson Bay. It's still depressed, that's why it's a bay. And so we glacier, got Hudson Bay. And yeah, then yeah, the, the glacier ripped up, that got our stuff. Yeah, the glacier ripped, it's called the term is called ripped up uh, rock, granite rock from that area and brought it down here. And when the glacier melts, it doesn't, it doesn't retreat northward, it just melts. And so everything that's in it drops out. And that's why we have we, our area between the Cuyahoga and the, and the Grand Valley, basically, uh, but between the Cuyahoga and the Chagrin, is an area uh, where the ice contained a lot of granite boulders. So if you, you know, if you drive around Northeast Ohio, you'll see more landscaping boulders in Euclid, South Euclid, Willoughby Hills, um, down into Chesterland, Shaker Heights, all that, because that's where the boulders are. You won't see them so much on the west side. You won't see them farther east. We have a finger of, of this hard rock from Canada here, and it ranges from big boulder size down to sand size, but a lot of it is pink. So when you say pink, that's what I think of, pink granite. Interesting. Now the blue, eh, I don't know what to say about blue. Blue, blue is I think going to be the gray. Why is bluestone bluestone? Bluestone is not blue. Yeah, it's like it's, a bluish gray. Yeah. But they're all like grayish pastels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have you know our except for the the, the granites, the we call them exotic rocks, exotic and erratic in the sense they're exotic in that they came from another place and they're erratic in the sense that they were picked up by the glacier. So we talk about exotic erratics here in town. Yeah. <laughs> sounds very appropriate. Right. Sounds like it should, yeah. <laughs> sounds like it should be in a bar someplace. Yeah. Well, this is very uh, more recent history, but I mean, I've heard that a lot of what washes up um, in our beach club here, Arcadia, and I've seen it I used to live at Moss Point, actually. 
um, and even at Sims Park, you see those concrete rocks. I heard that there was a lot of construction waste dumped a lot oh, yeah. a, long, a long time ago, and also bricks, rounded bricks. Yeah, yeah. Is that, is that true? Is that, oh, are yes, those it's true. Concrete ones, like, okay. <laughs> yeah, the the bricks, the bricks and the concrete are of different origin, um, but maybe dumped at the same time. I knew time. those weren't ancient history. <laughs> well, well, no, they aren't ancient history, but they're the beautiful thing about beaches is that they collect things from all over. So, you know, if you're in California, Oregon, you get things that wash over from Japan sometimes, right? Wow. And from the tsunami and, and things like that. Um, so if you stand in Euclid, our prevailing winds are from the west. So we get things from, you know, Sandusky Bay, and uh, the Maumee Bay, the Maumee River, uh, they end up washing up on our beach. Okay, so we have, you know, there is, I'm gonna make a little aside here. We've, I've gotten through this in good time, so we have some, some uh, time to field questions here. Um, so I'm 71 years old. When I was five, 10 years old, long time ago, on the beach, there was a lot of beach glass. There's almost no beach glass. I mean, there is, but compared to what there was, there's hardly any. And that's two things. Now there's plastic because our containers are plastic instead of glass. Okay? So we get plastic containers and very little. But the beach glass has been picked, almost picked clean. People really search for it. So there's not much of it left. It forms at a low rate, um, a much lower rate than people pick it up. So it's about to disappear. And same for the bricks. There was a time when everything that was in the ground was made of brick. So we had brick streets and paving bricks. So during the 70s, when streets were repaired, the underpinnings of the streets were still the old bricks. They just got dumped over. Paving bricks are very attractive to people. So most of those are now gone and they were only dumped in the 70s. And uh, other bricks from foundations, buildings torn down, brick foundations, those bricks end up there too, but people collect them to put them, put in their gardens. Nobody collects the ugly old concrete pieces. So the bricks and the concrete were dumped there in the same period in the 70s when the lake really came up. It had, the lake had been at a historic low for about a hundred years up until the late 60s, until 1969 or so. And then it came up very quickly and uh, it's in the 1970s, early 70s, into the 80s when finally the Corps of Engineers said enough of dumping trash into the lake to prevent erosion. So I'd say there were eight years in there, eight, yeah, about eight years when, uh, when contractors were just allowed to dump. Anytime you had a road building project, a road renewal project, the old concrete just got dumped over. And that's for the Euclid Waterfront Improvement Project, part of the expense of that project is to take out that concrete, which is not a stable footing for what needs to go down there now and is just not aesthetically pleasing at all. Does that answer your question, Alicia? Uh, it's funny that you said that nobody collects it because I started making a little retaining wall out of uh, it. Okay, well. <laughs> but I think it kind of looks cool, like all together, you know? Sure. For, like as accent stones, like, but you're right, because at first it was ugly, it looks like litter, and then you kind of get used to it. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, free litter I could use to <laughs> landscape. <That's right. laughs> it's kind of cool how it gets rounded over time. Sure. Um, do you have any insight on the um, the turquoise, like the greenish ones? Greenish. The greenish rocks. You you you, you had something to say about the pink and the blue. Yeah, no, Some I them are don't. Greenish. You know, there are. <laughs> Is it just pollution? Well, <laughs> I told my son it might just be pollution. Uh, I imagine that it's some kind of a, a constructed rock. It's a, you know, a fired brick-like, it's no, not no, no. natural. It's like a greenish hue to stuff like the, yeah. like stone. I mean, there are, there are some of these exotic erratics that are a certain kind of oh, quartzite. Oh, exotic erratics that, again, yeah, right, right. That, that explains are, a lot in Euclid. But, right? but they aren't common. <laughs> yeah. There are okay. some bright green rocks that are natural, but they're, you know, I've seen just a couple in my lifetime. Oh, yeah, not bright. No, the, just the subtle okay. pastels that you see. Well, yeah. thank you very much. Sure. You're welcome. Good to see you. Yeah. Good to see everybody else. <laughs> Roy, we have a question through chat. Yes. What about the rocks with shark 
teeth in the creek. Hmm. What about the rocks with shark teeth in the creek? Um, uh, so, uh, does the person want to unmute and uh, communicate directly about this? Because I'm unaware. Theoretically, there could be shark tooth fossils in Euclid Creek, but I have never heard of anyone finding. There are on the west side in Rocky River and Big Creek, there are shark fossils. There are entire shark carcasses well preserved with teeth and even with the stomach contents, uh, soft tissues. But I, I don't know of any in Euclid Creek. But sharks, sharks were Sharks were the dominant predator uh, 400 million years ago in this Devonian Sea when the coelacanth, when Chagrini and Otis lived. So there were many sharks, um, but Euclid is not a hotbed. So I, I really can't answer that without seeing. But it, all right, I'll finish this up by saying the Museum of Natural History has a very nice display of. Uh, the top predators of the Devonian Sea. And there's a range of sharks they have models of. And then there is this uh, fish called Dunkelosteus, which is just a huge thing, bigger than, than any shark. Uh, and it's called a placoderm, meaning that it had plaques, it had bone, bony uh, tissue on the outside. It has an exoskeleton, so to speak. And uh, it was an armored, it was armored with its exoskeleton. And uh, it was a different kind of predator than a shark. Didn't have sharp teeth like that, but they were also a top predator. This Devonian Sea, this after all, was the age of fishes. This, especially this Devonian period from about 490 million years to about mm, 400 million years, um, uh, 90 million years in there, uh, the age of fishes. And at that point, nothing lived on land, hardly anything lived on land. But the sea was teeming with fish, uh, all kinds. And there was room enough to have all kinds of sharks as predators, small to huge sharks, and this other line, the placoderms, from small to large. So when you see the number of top predators that are preserved in the fossils in the Cleveland area, you get an idea that this Devonian Sea, right on the equator, was warm, full of nutrients, and supported a, a rich fish life. So predator remains all around the area, but not so much in Euclid itself. Anyway, all this is at the Museum of Natural History. They have a very nice display. Because this, the Cleveland Shale, you know, the top of Mount Baldy, the Cleveland Shale has more fish fossils than the Chagrin Shale. And the Cleveland Shale is known worldwide for its fossil sharks and these placoderms. Hi, Roy. Uh, Hi. Bob and Kim. Hey, Bob. How are you doing? Uh, pretty good. Yourself? Still standing. A um, uh, bit of trivia or whatever. Um, you mentioned the rock caves over by Euclid Falls. Um, one of these is at the tail end of a Anderson property. Yes. And it, the rumor was around civ before Civil War time that it was used by um, fugitive slaves where they'd stay there during the day and at night they'd take the creek um, to the lake and there'd be boats there to take them to Canada. So it was part of the Underground Railroad. You know, all I can say to that is why not? Um, it, I, I haven't heard that one and uh, it sounds very interesting. These, you know, these, these kinds of, these kinds of, of anecdotes, let's say, that that have never been written up as primary history, you don't know what to do with them. I think you started to say this is a rumor. Yeah, and, and absolutely. It, yeah. It, it's, people don't it, document their felonies very well. Right. It reminds me of all the stories about liquor coming into Euclid uh, 
from Canada on boats, okay? And there are just all kinds of stories and tunnels, things like this. And I think it probably all boils down to, you know, two or three parties where somebody had a liquor come in on a boat, whether it's from Canada or not, who knows. But these kinds of small incidents get made into urban myths, so to speak. Now, I'm not discounting what you say, but what, all I can say is, why not? But that would be, a, if you wanted to hide, one of those rock shelters would be a decent place. Well, they didn't want them in their home because right. if they got caught that way, yeah. uh, they were in serious trouble. But uh, the cave out back, you could, uh, plausible deniability, I think. The, right, the, yeah. Well, well do, you, do you know where the Andersons or any of the other uh, quarry related families are they associated with abolition? I don't know that. Yeah, I mean that's what it would take. That's why I can compare that with the, you know, the the Cozad Bates House now, which uh, which is on Mayfield Road, almost in Euclid, uh, almost to Euclid Avenue. Um, so a nice brick Italianate house uh, belonged to the Cozad, built by the Cozads, which is an old early settler family uh, in that part of Cleveland, and later on to the Bates family. Um, and they were, the Cozads were, uh, and the Fords of Ford Road in the same area, they were associated with, with the abolitionist movement. And they were, so they did, they participated in the uh, Underground Railroad. And so the urban myth is that that Kozad Bates house that now will be saved and made into some kind of a, mm, an abolitionist museum, okay? That uh, there may have been fugitive slaves in there, but nobody knows, there's no proof, okay? And if people have been working on that one for years. All right, thanks for this, Bob. I'll keep my ears open because you never know. Uh, another question through chat. Yeah. Is there public access to Mount Baldy and Euclid Falls? <laughs> Is your presentation available to Euclid schools? Uh, all right, I'll take them in order. Well, Mount Baldy is on Metro Park's property. Okay. And the trouble is that it's 120 steep feet up from Euclid Creek. You have to, to get to it in the metro parks, first of all, you have to, you know, you park in the, in the Glen Ridge, in the lowest most picnic area, Glen Ridge, and then you got to descend the, the cliff to walk through the creek, get on the other side, and then you got to climb at least 120 feet up to the top. It's really difficult and a bit dangerous. Now, on the, on the uh, land connection side, on the neck end, um, it connects with private property. Okay. So there are residences, I just can't remember the name of the road up there, but uh, you cannot access it the easy way from the top. You've got to climb up from the bottom. And it's, if you're young and fit, it's, uh, it's worth it. Okay. But um, it's not for everyone. That's that. Now Euclid Falls is a little easier. <clears throat> Euclid Falls you park in, and Bob, you can, Bob McKim, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think you, you go into, on the right side of the, no, on the east side of the parkway, opposite the little ranger station, there is a driveway down, it's called Rear Quarry, and you go down that driveway, you cross the creek very quickly, and then it opens up and there are a dozen parking spaces there. So you park there, and uh, you can walk across a mowed field, walk due southward following the creek, and you go up and up, and pretty soon you get into these Berea sandstone boulders that are old quarry, quarry waste, and you just go and you go, and you get into the most amazing landscape of rock shelters and fallen blocks, blocks the size of houses, uh, it's really wonderful and you can, and then there's a tributary that's through a narrow gorge into the creek and you can finally walk up to Anderson Road where it gets difficult as well. That is also Metro Parks and uh, it's, it's easier access than Mount Baldy. 
that's well worth it. I could recommend that for anyone who is up for a moderate hike. Park in rear quarry, the first parking lot on the rear quarry driveway and walk due southward following the creek and you'll get to the rock shelters. You'll get to the gorge, the gulch. Oh, the, yeah, the gulch. Um, so I use this term gulch. And we do have a number of, uh, of terms for uh, ravines that are derived from the same Anglo-Saxon term. Okay? And that is gulf, gulch, gully. I think there's one more there that I don't right now. Okay? But obviously these are the same term somewhere in the past and they have become differentiated. And they're mostly New England terms or you know, uh, Old English. Uh, so the, the, the uh, this Moses Cleveland surveyors, when they surveyed Euclid, they called Euclid Creek, they called it two things, the Big Creek and the Gulf. Okay? And then they reserved the term gulch for those areas like up close to Anderson Road, where the Berea sandstone overhangs in rock shelters. So there is Stebbins Gulch. Most of us know the name anyway, even if we haven't been there. And uh, there's also the Lake Metro Park. Stebbins Gulch is a property of Holden Arboretum. Okay, farther to the north, there's Penitentiary Glen. That's a Lake Metro Parks reservation. The early settler name for that was Penitentiary Gulch. Glen is another one that derives from, from these G words. <clears throat> okay, so, and that is like Stebbins Gulch and like Euclid Creek. It's a Berea sandstone, you know, narrow cut. Oh, one of them that I would love to find in Northeastern Ohio is a term that you find in coastal Maine, gut, okay? where you have two islands that are close together or two rocks and there's a navigational passage between them. It's called a gut. So gut, gulf, gorge, and gully. Did I, uh, there's one more question and that is about the availability of this. Was that the question, Carla? Uh, is your presentation available to Euclid schools? This one. Yes. That is up to the Euclid Public Library. <laughs> So maybe you would address well, that, Carla. We'll share the link with them. Okay. It should be put on the library's YouTube channel and the link can be shared. We had one more comment. Um, love your hikes. A geology hike could be done with social distance plus masks. What do you think, Roy? Uh, what I, all right. If the yes, so with that comment, the person knows me, and if he or she would like to contact me, uh, can discuss this maybe. And it's my feeling that we're all adjusting. I am no longer just myself. You know, I work with watershed groups, work with the sewer district um, to try to do this kind of thing, educational outreach, a little more systematically. And what we're doing this year is drawing back from the on-site tours uh, to these kinds of things, which we've never done before. And, you know, we all love the tours. The trouble with the tours is that once you do them, it's gone. It comes and it goes. The advantage of this is that there's a legacy to it. And that will be the link uh, on the library YouTube channel. So we are... I'm part of a group that is really dedicating this summer to doing these kinds of things. And then I think we'll revisit in the fall uh, the idea of tours. Okay. But yeah, yeah, I miss it. Would love to do it. So contact me. You want to talk about trees for a second? Sure. Uh, I have a tree that uh, sprouted by itself out of my neighbor's yard when I was a child that is probably 70 feet tall already. And I always thought it was a poplar. Um, and um, about 10 years ago, I had to hire a company to come take a limb down and uh, the uh, 
arborist told me that it's a cottonwood and that it's a male cottonwood because we never saw any of the seeds. I didn't know there was a male and a female cottonwood. The tree, is, the tree has been nothing but a pain, but we can't bear to take it down because of the shade it provides. Right, right. But in the springtime, it, uh, it drops the, uh, uh, the seeds and I have, it's almost like tar on the car. You have to scrape it off. And in the fall, the uh, leaves, when they come down, have the same sappy type of thing that sticks all over my car, and I hate it. I just wondered if, uh, if you knew there was a male and female cottonwood. Oh, yes. And poplar cottonwood, same tree. Just two oh, different okay. names. So I wasn't insane then. <laughs> nope. No, not at all. No, I grew the, the local terminology the, is poplar. And the, uh, you know, the more mm, proper common name is cottonwood. Thank because you. There are, because there are a number of things that are called poplar. So, for example, a tulip tree uh, is sometimes called a tulip poplar. And I'm not quite sure why. Maybe they're, they aren't closely related. But anyway, um, yes, cottonwoods are, were very important trees, and they're beautiful, and they're rapid growth and asymmetry. Um, you know, they get huge sometimes uh, without being all that old. You know, a Moses Cleveland tree white oak, that is one that's going to be 200 years old, will be mm, six feet in diameter. A, a Moses Cleveland poplar would be 11 feet, uh, 12 feet, 13 feet in diameter. They grow so quickly. And because of that, they don't, a 200 year old poplar is very old. Um, uh, it's uh, like a big dog, you know, they just don't grow at all. Uh, but they're, all native trees are, they serve an, an ecological purpose, they're well adapted, all of that, but they are, we call them kind of messy trees. And for the last hundred years, we've tended to shy away from native trees because they drop the catkins in the case of the poplars, they drop the seed pods, whatever it is, the monkey balls, and people don't like to clean up. Um, but uh, now we're finding that the native trees really are good trees to have, and it's worth cleaning up after them and dealing with the, you know, the sap that sometimes uh, can coat things. Uh, but sure, cottonwoods are beautiful trees. There aren't so many left. There'll be a time, not so long a time, when there'll be none left in Euclid. Right. Yeah, uh, she also has a black walnut in the corner yeah. of her property, too. <laughs> yeah, there's another one that people blow hot and cold on because what do you do with the walnuts? <laughs> They're a mess. <laughs> thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Roy. That was very, very informative. I really did learn a lot tonight. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks for your questions. And hopefully we will have Roy at another presentation and Maybe it will be in the library next time, but if not, we'll try Zoom again and everyone have a good evening.